Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer. My name is Dan, and this week's featured guest is Sevish. Sevish is a musician and producer from London in the United Kingdom, where most of the world uses standard tuning, also known as 12-tone equal temperament tuning. Sevish uses alternative tunings, creating microtonal music. Sevish has built a following on YouTube where his tracks Gleam, Droplet, Desert Island Rain, and Ganymede have been widely watched with his channel exceeding 2 million views and counting. His new album Bubble is available at sevish.bandcamp.com album forward slash bubble and everywhere you get your music. You can find Sevish at sevish.com. That's S-E-V-I-S-H.com youtube.com forward slash Sevish, and I highly recommend checking out his website because there's so much cool content on there. There is years of learning about microtonal music or Zen harmonic music, as Sevish might prefer to call it. Um, radically awesome. Sevish, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come on. Doing quite well. Thank you. <laughs> Sevish, to get us started, uh, what's a piece of music or a song that you've heard in the past couple of days that really stood out to you? Oh, um, the last couple of days, I don't know. I've been listening to some cheesy music at the moment. I've been listening to some old Eurobeat records. Um, so more, more about catchy hooks and things like that. But I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to say about that. So these these Eurobeat <laughs> records you're looking at with catchy hooks, is this sort of part of research for a new project or are you just trying to listen to some hooky music? No, I've just been watching a, a TV program that's got this music in the background and I'm finding it kind of catchy, but very <laughs> cheesy. Um, <laughs> what TV program, if you don't mind my ass? It's called, it's called Initial D. It's, um, it's like a cartoon from the 90s about racing. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, is not, this is not usual for me. But um, yeah. Well, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. I've just been watching on Netflix the uh, the Formula One show, so that's that, oh, yeah. that, that, that's about as much overlap as we're going to get on the racing, I think, for today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Sevish, can you describe for us, if it's not putting you on the spot, uh, a little bit what you mean by Zen harmonic, or just in general, what Zen harmonic means? And we're spelling Zen harmonic X E N H a R O uh, M O N I C Zen harmonic. Can you explain a little bit what this means? Yeah, Zen harmonic was a word coined by a microtonalist from um, the last few decades called Ivor Darig. And um, what this ex what this describes is music that sounds different from the standard twelve tone equal temperament. So there's kind of a value judgment in there in like what kind of mood is the music giving off. And if it gives off a mood that is very similar to um, standard Western tuning, then that's not Zen harmonic, and then everything else would be Zen harmonic. Um, there's all kinds of little phrases and words that, that you, you hear about microtonality. I'm kind of fine with all of them. None of them seem to be perfect. Um, but yeah, I'm happy with microtonal, Zen harmonic. So the implication of using the word zen harmonic is in addition to being microtonal that it's really feeling like it's outside of the normal boundaries of 12 tone music so it needs to f impart a feeling or give a different vibe essentially that's right and that that sets it apart from microtonal music such as um let's say traditional western music that may use alternative tunings um historical tunings but the music still being diatonic and very easily understood in terms of um, scales, modes, major, minor, that kind of thing that we'd be used to. So an everything else is enharmonic. An example might be uh, the microtones involved in blues. While we do play around with the concepts of major and minor, we sort of have a major minor fluidity within the blues. We are using microtones, but within a context that is distinctly tonal and distinctly part of that sort of family of the 12 tone. That's right. Yeah, specifically that blues kind of uses a tonal framework of 12 equal notes, even if melodically it bends around that and does other really cool stuff around that. 
a couple of uh, questions I have for you, uh, just for our listeners, as we move forward and we sort of do a little bit more of a deep dive uh, into your uh, Zen harmonic world. C- could you please clarify what TET stands for in relation to uh, microtonal scales and music? Okay, so this is the idea of equal temperament. So the ET comes from equal temperament. So a familiar reference for um, everyday musicians who've grown up in the West and maybe learned a couple of things from uh, the way we do things is that we have 12 equal notes in an octave. So the octave is the kind of the kind of tonal, fr- well, is a kind of frame. Yeah. Um, and w- we divide that into different steps. So you could see the t- traditional tuning system as 12 TET or 12 tone equal temperament. However, you could change that number. Why not, why not have 13 tones? And we divide that octave into 13 equal tones and see what kind of music can be produced with that. And so basically, if we think of an octave as being 100% uh, or 100 divisions, we're, we're dividing that into 12 equal parts for 12 TET, or as you just alluded to, we could divide it into 13, 14, 8, 4, uh, 256, 53 different equal yep. divisions of that octave and by virtue of those divisions create microtonal music if we're going, let's say, to 13. Or I guess it even depends on how you're dividing it. Uh-oh, we're going down the rabbit hole, people. Here we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so much detail in this kind of music and there's so many different directions. And right now we're only talking about equal scales. Um, there's there's non-equal scales. And then you don't even have to divide the octave. There's music that doesn't even have octaves. So let's say if you have the note C, there will be no other C in that tuning because there are no octaves. Therefore, that pitch class only appears once. There's like so many different little rabbit holes within this. And so once you get into it, you, you can just keep going down this path for years and years. It never You never run out of things to explore. And I think the fascinating thing too is that even though this stuff has been explored for the past couple of decades, we're at a place where, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we have people inventing names for scales. Like we get things like, I mean, my goodness, centaur tuning in scales and things like this that are are just getting created and sort of pulled out of nothing, but we're creating this whole new system. Uh, when I was talking to Dave Fujinski, one of the things he was so excited about with his work with his students was that every semester someone invents a new scale, someone discovers something new. And so there's all this new ground to be broken. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what EDO means? Okay, for most purposes, EDO means the same thing as TET. Um, EDO stands for equal divisions of the octave. So it's a slightly more descriptive term. Um, There is a very slight difference between the meaning, or let's say there's a difference in context. Because um, when we think of a temperament, we tempering is to make something slightly impure. That's where that word comes from. So when we talk about, for example, 12 tone equal temperament and 12 EDO, 12 equal divisions of the octave, the tuning is the same. However, 12 tone equal temperament means we have some idea that um, these intervals are are approximations of pure, let's say maybe just intonation intervals, and that this tuning is a temperament, Hmm. whereas EDO doesn't make any judgment about whether this is a temperament, whether this is supposed to approximate other things. It's literally just a description. But the actual tunings will be exactly the same. So the distinction is so slight that it almost doesn't exist well the distinction is slight but the ramifications in terms of outlook and artistic intention are substantial because if we're thinking just in terms of creating a culture around how this music is approached you're either coming to it from a sort of neutral positive perspective or from like you're saying sort of a negative way of saying well there's something better than this and we're muddying the waters by creating this system. Yeah, right. So I have a question for you about your music. Um, Everything up to 2015's Now and Zen, 
we can hear that you are making microtonal movements, microtonal gestures, um, but it is, and I, I, I'm not going to try and pigeonhole you here. I'll just speak from my sort of perception of your music, and that is that it's, it was almost like you were tethered to tonality up until 2015 and then starting with now and zen there's this there's this complete rupture of that connection and you really move sort of head down charging bull straight into microtonality can you talk about what changed there because i think you had three years in between albums there what happened in those three years and what shifted for you Okay, so this is new to me because I, I wasn't aware that that was when there was a change and before that I was kind of being tethered and after that. So that's an interesting perspective. Um, I've not really thought of it like that. The way I think of it is I am interested in different flavours of um, of music and I think that tunings kind of get us to these different places. And um, in the beginning, I was exploring lots of different tunings kind of in this in this rush to to sample little bits here and there of, of all these different things, all these different ideas. And um, it might be what you're describing is that as I've listened to more and more music I and more microtonal music, I've internalised more of these unusual structures that weren't present in the tonal system that I grew up with. So it may be that when I started out, I'm still everything I'm hearing in my head is still a reference back to the music I've heard all of my life. The stuff I hear on the radio, the pop music, the nursery rhymes, all of that stuff that comes from existing inside a culture. And um, over time, I've been able to pick up new little tricks that I can bring out. Um, but at the same time, I think I've always had some variation. I think I've always had those tracks that very much reminded me of diatonic music um, that very much are that they're microtonal, but they're reference to just Western music that I'm familiar with. And then I have other tracks where the, the tunings don't relate at all. And I just try and make something that sounds good. And wouldn't that's always been there. Would an example of a track of yours that sort of uh, is reminiscent of tonal music be something like Gleam, for example, where we have that chord progression that is, it's almost like this R&B type chord progression going through it. Uh, but with those alternate tunings where it's like, you know, when you walk in one of those wacky houses and like you've got walls that are just a couple mm -hmm. degrees off, it's like you realize something's not quite right. Well, and again, yeah, yeah. okay, but sorry, l let me back that up because see, even saying not quite right, that's me coming to it from a temper, a tempered sort of perspective, uh, something that is maybe, let's say, um, a departure from 12 tone. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you're well within your right to say that something doesn't sound quite right, but with the implication that it doesn't quite sound right to you because maybe you haven't experienced that before and right and um but as you continue listening to these things they start to sound right um which is very odd and i think you're spot on about the kind of r b thing i was definitely trying to go for a kind of r b ish kind of progression so you've got that whole kind of two five one kind of chord progression but with like the triatone triatone substitution but i'm filling in um, chords in the gaps. Um, this is where it gets hazy for me because I don't approach music like an analyst. Um, I've, I just like to do stuff and make stuff that sounds cool. So I started from the idea of, I want to do something that has this kind of R and B ish progression, but in experimenting with that and messing around, I found that I could slot extra chords in because I've got I would, this, this tuning in this song, the song's called Gleam and the tuning is 22 EDO. So that's 22 equal divisions of the octave. It has some very interesting um, characteristics, this tuning, because it has tr conventional triads available. I can play a major chord. I can play a minor chord. The difference is because of the tuning being slightly different, you don't end up in the same place that you expect to be. For example, if I think of a circle of fifths, I know that after I could start on a C and I could go up a few steps and I'm on an E. But in 22, you don't end up there. You end up somewhere between an E and an F because the fifths are sharper. So when you start stacking these sharp fifths, you end up, you, you after a few steps, this error accumulates and you end up on different notes. In, in a sense, functional harmony exists, but the rules are different. 
Okay, so on this and <laughs> sorry, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Yeah, so uh, and please excuse me if I'm like totally noobing you out right now, but the even the concept of fifths is a little bit of a mind bend. How are you? What what is the qualification for a fifth? Because if we were to do a one to one ratio of twelve edo versus twenty two edo. It's it's not the same. We're going up seven steps in twelve, uh, seven half steps in uh, twelve uh, twelve EDO to achieve a fifth. How are you getting to a fifth in twenty two EDO? Um, I think it's thirteen steps. Okay. Thirteen or fourteen? I think it's thirteen steps. Um, I might be wrong on that, but yeah. So and the the tuning of the fifth is slightly different in twelve tone. Um, the the fifth is a little bit narrow it's a little bit flat compared to a just perfect fifth the just perfect fifth is okay again there's there's just so many little details to this but if you think of um if you think of a, a pitch has uh you can measure a pitch with hertz sure okay and so a fifth is two different pitches it's an interval so it's the difference between two pitches so you can measure the frequency of both of those yes okay so let's imagine i have um 220 hertz that's my a let's okay. say yeah a3 and 300 right and uh and 330 would be a pure fifth and that is a ratio of three over two or you can think of it as 1.5 that's a frequency ratio you can multiply that by 220 and you will find the note that is a fifth above but in the equal tempered system we don't have these pure ratios like three over two they're these very long, many, many digits after the decimal place, slightly complicated looking numbers. Um, and in 12 equal to so the tuning we're all used to, um, it's slightly flat. It's about two cents flat or just under two cents flat, which by my estimation is pretty damn good. It's very pure sounding, almost pure sounding. But in 22 Edo, the fifths are, oh, I can't remember exactly, but I think they might be about seven cents sharp. But the quality of that interval, for me, still sounds like a fifth, still sounds quite pure, still sounds quite nice, usable, musical, um, but it's a slightly different characteristic. Could you maybe talk a little bit about your approach to making microtonal music? And I'll, I'll clarify the question uh, with an example. Um, I was speaking with uh, Dave Fuse Fujinski. He was talking about he has maybe five different ways of approaching microtonal music. So tonal on the bottom, microtonal on the top. Tonal on the top, microtonal on the bottom. Uh, a singer singing microtonally, which is sort of what we might think of the melody, and then everyone else is tonal. Uh, everyone else is microtonal. Singer is uh, tonal. Uh, all sorts of different permutations and combinations. Do you have any sort of go-to um, combinations that you really like to experiment with? Um, no, not really. I, c I can, for me, it's all microtonal mm. um, because I will tune up all of the synths that I get because I'm an electronic musician, so I'm working with synths and I like to get all of my synths in the same system. Within one piece of music, I'll put them all in the same system. But I can appreciate Dave's approach because, you know, he's actually got chops. You know, he like plays and he's really good at his instrument and because of that, you know, he plays live and he plays with all of these different people. And when you're working between different instruments, there's limitations for each instrument. Okay, a violin can play all those microtones if the performer has the ear, if they have the training to attain those notes um, consistently and accurately. Um, or say Dave with his guitar, with the fretless guitar, um, but a piano doesn't have that possibility. So, if you're working within a specific context and you have piano, guitar, drums, for example, then implicitly, I think the piano will be tuned to standard tuning. So you're then, you've got this kind of bedrock of standard tonality and then the microtones happening over the top. So I can appreciate why um, Dave has all of these combinations because he could be working with many different musicians. And then sometimes he finds ways that the whole band can tune up to a specific mode or a specific scale. Um, whereas for me, uh, you know, I'm working with synthesizers. So the, the benefit of a synthesizer is it's working with data. 
So if I can specify my tuning in terms of data, which with the aid of software is very easy to do, then I'm just a couple of button clicks from retuning the entire thing. You know, a piano will take you several hours to tune, but a keyboard that supports microtones, it's just a click of a button. Um, so I can afford to explore music where everything's in very specific tunings. And I highly recommend anyone listening to this podcast after you're done, go to sevish.com because you lay down in incredible detail all these processes and the way you do all this stuff. It's really, really an incredible website. How has your approach for making microtonal music evolved over time with what you've learned and what you've listened to? So we we discussed a little bit about uh, a shift in the music that you're making uh, sort of um, pre-2015 uh, and post-2015 or at 2015, which um, but might be sort of an eye, an eye of the beholder in my case, but you clearly have this artistic progression. You clearly have this artistic growth. How did you first start trying to get into this? And then what are you doing now to continue and further this incredible exploration? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think all composers benefit from listening and being omnivorous in your listening and trying to get as much in as possible because the things that you listen to, you internalize and the things that you internalize come out in your music. Um, and that might be part of what's happening with my progression as a musician, which I think I still feel like a total beginner um, quite a lot of the time. So um, hopefully that progression has got a long way to go. And um, I think in the beginning is, yeah, this, this rush to explore different things and um, not quite, not quite discovering the depth of certain tunings. Where in my most recent work, I'm only using three different kinds of tuning. I'm using 22 equal divisions of the octave. I'm using seven equal divisions of the octave, and I'm using just intonation. So for the whole album, there's only really three approaches to tuning, and you can just pick a tuning and go deep and find all of the things that will do, because some of them will, will take a lifetime to explore. Just as people take a lifetime to explore the standard tuning that we've all inherited, um, the same is true for other alternative tunings that are not really um, a part of any traditional culture. Um, I, I'm really sorry, I might have gone a bit off the, the topic, so if you can remind me of the question, and I'll try and bring this back in. <laughs> no, it's all good. So the question was, uh, we were talking about looking at the progression and what you're trying to understand now, which I think you answered, you're really doing a deep dive. You mentioned 22 um, Edo or EDO is sort of your favorite place to live in right now. Um, yeah. But then also experimenting with seven EDO and um, I don't recall the last one. The last one was just intonation. Yeah, just intonation. So what's your process like to deepen your relationship with these tunings? Um, if there's any available stuff to listen to, definitely listening. And then just find an instrument and tune it up and just spend the time and just explore it. If you can find a way to get an instrument that you can tune and you can accurately get that tuning, um, just use your ears and just try and find things that will work well. And every tuning has different things that it can do and can't do. It's my belief that there's no perfect tuning. Um, you can never have everything perfectly in tune. You can never have all tonal resources available to you. I work with some tunings that don't have available tonal resources that I want. Sometimes I want to do something kind of nostalgic and something that you know sounds like the music I grew up with. And there are tunings that can't do that. It's just not possible. But then those tunings can do some wild other stuff that, um, that, that, that kind of excite me in other ways. So yeah, I've got to have a few of those in my, in my toolbox. So let's, let's draw a direct comparison here. So let's say a jazz study of modes that in and of itself could sort of take a lifetime. So are you doing any sort of uh, breaking down permutation? And I know it's going to be different because when you're working with 22 notes in an octave, it's it's just the permutation of triads 
And again, not triads in the way we think of triads, but triads is in three note chords. The, the permutations there are, it's insane. And then you go into inversions, it's, it's wild. So do you ever sort of run yourself through boot camps or do sort of mathematical permutations to make sure you explore all the options? Oh, no, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people do that. A lot of people are inclined to do that. But I'm just in it for the kind of aesthetic value of these <laughs> tunings and the experience of just um, exploring them. And yeah, you're right about things like um, the resources, like the triads. You know, in a tuning like 22, I really like it because I, I have major and minor triads. The flavor of them is slightly different. You know, the minor third is slightly sharp compared to standard tuning. The major third is slightly flat compared to major tuning um, but you but that sounds recognizable and if I was just playing a single chord you'd think oh yeah it just sounds like normal music it's where you have chord progressions you end up in these unexpected places and then on top of that there's additional resources 22 equal divisions you can have sub minor thirds so you can have sub minor triads these sound like minor but they're just a bit more grave they're just a little bit more serious sounding and you have super major triads as well, uh, which sound extremely bright, um, kind of jarring, a little slightly out of tune sounding, very restless sounding, the super major triads, but they have their context as well. Um, and I, I love exploring that stuff. I don't ever feel a pressure that I need to fully explore something or that there might be little avenues that are untapped because I can always find them at some point in the future. And even if I don't, someone else will, which I hope because Ultimately, I want to hear more microtonal music, so I hope that people that maybe discover me or discover all kinds of other stuff that discover traditional music that's been using microtones since the beginning of music, um, I, I want all these people to get inspired and make microtonal music because I want to listen to it. I hope that doesn't <laughs> sound very selfish, but like I really want to hear it. it it's always um, it's always fascinating. Well, you set a very interesting precedent by keeping things listenable and, as you say, funky. So the music, even though it is within this microtonal uh, cadre, it's still, we're still, it's listenable. Like I played it for my girlfriend who doesn't know like the first thing about microtones, but she was like, you know, bopping along with it. And like, it makes sense that for the slightly educated or even uneducated uh, music listener, you can still get something out of the music, which is a really interesting line to walk. Yeah, I, I try really hard to do that. You know, I don't always succeed. And there's, you know, there's a ton of people that, that won't like my music. It's always going to be the case, no matter who you are. And, um, but yeah, I do try. I think that, um, you know, I had this experience when I was first getting into microtones. And um, it, this was something I discovered when I was online. I was reading Wikipedia and reading about different kinds of music. Um, and when I started to communicate with other people who were interested in microtones, I found that there's very much an academic angle to all of this. And a lot of people were interested in it because they're part of maybe they're contemporary classical musicians. They write very out there music and microtones are a means towards that end. And I was into it because it sounded cool to me and was wondering, um, you know, how I could use this for myself. But I would play some of the microtonal music that I was listening to that I found online, play it to my friends. And like, this is terrible. I don't, I don't get it. Because it's the style of music is very important. And people relate more to genre than they do. What tuning system are you using? And it's, you know, what it's, this is very technical stuff. What tuning system are you using? Most listeners are not really interested in that. In the same way, they're not interested in what compressor you're using or what kind of EQ curve is on certain instrument. Okay, these are details that maybe are more interesting to other musicians and people that are in the know. But my kind of um, interest is in making it approachable by being within a genre. Um, so I've been interested in electronic music ever since I was very young. You know, I grew up in the nineties. The UK in the 90s, there was lots of electronic music going on. It was kind of an explosion of creativity um, and in many other places in the world throughout the 80s and 90s. So listening to all of that really inspired me. When I finally realized I could make my own music, I wanted to make electronic music. Um, so I try and 
use my microtones in styles of music that would uh, appeal to other listeners of microtonal music. But you I mean you could have microtones are not a genre; they're just another technique you can use. So um, you could make bluegrass. You know, any any genre you could think of, you could apply microtones to it somehow. Changing gears here a little bit, uh, what are your thoughts on Atlantis? Atlantis, the um, the country under the sea, or the yeah, under the sea. yeah. We hear some references in the music. Uh, looking through your biography, we have some references to oh, ancient yeah. knowledge and numerology. So, just wanted to pick your brains on your thoughts on Atlantis. Uh, Atlantis, I don't have any thoughts on that. I know the track you're talking about. This is, um, I was recording a conversation between me and some friends, and one of my friends was talking about Atlantis, and I sampled that and I put it in a track. Um, the, the answer is it's ironic. I don't care about numerology. I think it's really silly, but I try and bring that into my music because I know that some people are interested in it, and it's just a little, just a little thing in there. It's just a little reference for those people that are interested in numerology. But no, it's totally ironic. So the I think idea, it's dumb, to be honest. <laughs> so it's really you're just sort of leaving these Easter eggs that don't go anywhere just to sort of pique the interest of it's all it's almost like you're trolling people who think of it like are believing in Atlantis and stuff like that. Is that is that sort of the idea? It's this sort of little little nugget of irony that you're just sort of dropping in songs from time to time. Uh, well, I didn't really believe that anyone would listen to that and be trolled by it. So that wasn't really in my my intention. But it was just um, when I listened to that little clip, I had an impression of like, oh, what about this? You know, my friend's talking about, oh, there's Atlantis, there's ancient maps or, or whatever he's saying. And um, I don't know, that left me with an impression. And I think as I think artists are in the business of creating impressions in the mind of other people. Hmm. So... Yeah, I like to leave little nuggets, all kinds of little nuggets there and details. And, you know, when I'm working on music, it takes me a long time to finish things because I'm always iterating over it. I'm always listening and thinking, is there another little thing there? Or there's a little blank spot over there for just a little a little thing, a little event could happen in this part, of the, this part of the song. I'm always trying to drop those little nuggets in wherever I can. Can you maybe give an example of where you dropped in a nugget about numerology? Because I was not able to discern where a nugget might have been in your discography. Um, I think I might have done a track with where the reference tuning was 432 hertz. I think I did that as a, a joke on something. There was also, um, for anyone who doesn't know about 432 hertz, there's like um, a conspiracy that became popular on the internet that certain frequencies are bad for you which um, as far as I understand, um, there's no basis of evidence for that whatsoever. Um, but there are people who are proponents of certain frequencies and that they are there are natural frequencies. Um, uh, to me, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, you know, sometimes I've used some of those to be like, hey, I've used, I've used the magical frequency. Myself knowing it doesn't mean anything. So um, to, to be clear, Sevish, you've not experienced better sleep by listening to A32 played through a speaker for seven hours while you're sleeping because I hear it does wonders. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nothing. It hasn't healed my DNA. No, nothing. <laughs> it, I, it, I, yo, for real. People talking about... My hair like, didn't come back, so... <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the uh, people talking about like vibrating on a higher spiritual level with different frequencies like okay maybe but can we measure it with something <laughs> mm. the, my favorite one is that um certain frequencies were used by um by monks back in the day of gregorian chant and that somehow they could actually uh create those frequencies exactly with whatever it was 11th century technology <laughs> it, it just sounds ridiculous to me they had this one little tuning bowl that they passed around the monasteries that was like exactly right and then they needed to make sure that the temperature was right on that day and they needed to check the humidity level on yeah. their 11th century technology to make sure that their hertz was going to yeah. translate just right and the other thing is hertz is a, a measurement of how many cycles per second and the definition of a second has changed 
in history. Um, you know, I think it was during the 20th century we redefined the second. So they're thinking, oh, 432 has all of these numerological properties. So 432 hertz must be this magical frequency. But is that hertz before the change or after? And does it matter? Oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to pull us out of the rabbit hole with the uh, with mm. this next one. Um, can you talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, Centaur tuning, or is that the 22 EDO you were talking about before? No, that's not um, Centaur tuning. I've only been working with this recently. It's not my own tuning. This is a tuning by um, a musician called Craig Grady. Um, really interesting musician. Builds a lot of instruments of his own design. Um, creates a lot of tunings of his own design. Um, has um, learned a lot from a famous tuning theorist called Irv Wilson. Um, and uh, this was his tuning. So he called it Centaur. I guess if you make a, a tuning, you need some way of um, communicating to others when you're talking about specific tunings. So people that explore things and find a new scale, so there's loads of scales and tunings that are you know, still left undiscovered. Um, tend to give them a name. So there's all kinds of random names. Um, yeah, it's something I've been experimenting with just a little bit, but um, I haven't really gone too far down that um, that path yet. But I've got a couple of instruments that are tuned to Centaur at the moment. I have a kalimba that's tuned to a subset of Centaur. So it's kind of like a C minor but with a slightly different flavor. And I have a melodica as well, which has the entire tuning on it. Okay, where do you get this melodica, or do you custom? How? Oh, I don't know if you. I've got it here. I don't know if you recognize these. Very, st you could buy these very easily. I think this one just cost me thirty pounds a few years ago. Um, but if you take the case off of the melodica, underneath you will find the reeds. The reeds are like a long, thin sheet of metal, like a long, flat finger of metal. And what I did was I used an engraving tool. Again, very cheap to get hold of. I used an um, electric engraver tool to file away at the reeds. And if you file at one side of the reed, the pitch goes up. And if you file at the other side, the pitch goes down. So I spent the time and I, uh, I got the tuning uh, in terms of hertz. So I understood what frequency each pitch should be. And I had a little app on my phone that tells you how many hertz you're at. And I would blow on the reed and listen to it and then be like, okay, it's a bit sharp. I need to flatten that one. And then I did that for all of them. And then I had, within a day, I had an instrument that was that was tuned. I've I've bought a second melodica because I want to do this again. They, they, they're quite cheap, these melodicas. Um, so lots of fun to be had there. So you're customizing your melodicas to fit within these microtonal universes. It's fascinating. Yeah, pretty much. Now, uh, you mentioned the marimba uh, that you are uh, adjusting the tuning of uh, to create a subset uh, or a subtuning. Uh, it's, this, um, it's a kalimba. Kalimba, excuse me. This one. Yeah, there we go. Now, yeah, that's right. You mentioned to me when we were speaking before this podcast, you were actually able to adjust the tuning using magnets. Can you describe that process? That is correct. For, for those uh, viewers on YouTube will see on the video, there's a magnet just there. For anyone who's not watching it, I have um, very tiny stack, or well, a stack of very tiny neo, neodymium magnets on one of my kalimba tines. So putting aside the magnets for a moment, the standard way of tuning a kalimba, a kalimba is an instrument with these long metal, uh, long kind of pieces of metal. And if I get a pair of pliers, I can push that up or down. This is quite difficult to do, but you can, you can tune the instrument that way because it's held very tightly um, from the top. It will hold its tuning for quite a long time. So that would be the standard way of tuning a kalimba. However, in addition to that, you can also use magnets. Now, if you, uh, um, because it's metal, it will track a magnet, you know, magnetism and all that stuff. Uh, that makes the mass of the tine increase. And something with, a, with more mass will vibrate more slowly. So the more 
magnets I put on here, the lower the pitch becomes. And it's not just the additional mass, but also the, the position of the magnets affects the pitch. If I have it closer to the top, um, the, the effect on the pitch will be less. And if I have it closer to the bottom, then the effect will be more. So I can use that to very quickly get a different, um, to, to lower the pitch on any of these tines. And the reason I'm doing that is because my, as I said, my kalimba is in a kind of C minor. You can think of it as a kind of C minor with a slightly different flavor to it. And this low note here would be a B, uh, B flat. But if I put these magnets on it, I can get it down to a G. And G is a more important note in C minor, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I quite like the sound of that. And that's how I tune my kalimba now. That is super fascinating. And I think I actually have the same kalimba as you because mine oh, really? came from the UK. Fascinating. Oh, cool. So you talked about some strategies for using alternative tunings, uh, using synthesizers. Can you talk a little bit uh just a little bit in depth. And again, I recommend anyone listening to this afterwards, go listen to Savish's discography and go to savish.com and read your blog because you really go into incredible depth there. You even cite, well, I mean, I got lost like page five of this white paper from this guy from 1998 talking about dividing. It's insane amounts of information. It's so cool. Uh, but could you give us maybe just like a, a brief primer here? Um. Well, yeah, first I've got to say uh, thanks. I'm glad you appreciated the site. Um, I, I didn't have access to these kind of resources. So anytime I learn something cool, I put it on the site just to try and help others get into this crazy world that I'm, I'm exploring. Um, the, uh, the question was about synthesizers and tuning those. What I'm about to say will quickly become obsolete because with um, uh, MIDI polyphonic expression, um, there are on the horizon new ways of tuning synthesizers. But what I'm going to tell you is the way I've been doing it for the last 12 or 13 years. So not all synthesizers, and we can talk about hardware and software synthesizers, but I'm mainly working with software. Generally, this applies to hardware as well. So to but, be clear, as we're heading into this, you're using a MIDI controller to input pitches, and then on the software end, that's where the magic's happening. Well, yeah, almost. I'm using a MIDI controller to input MIDI notes. Yes. And it's within the synthesizer that specific pitches are attained. Correct. So not all synthesizers can do that is the key thing. If I already have a bunch of, let's say I'm new to this and I already have purchased a bunch of synths, not all of them will be able to be microtuned. Some of them assume that you only want the chromatic scale, 12 equal. Um, but some of them do allow you to retune them. And the method of retuning is slightly different for each one, but there are a couple of main ways that this happens. And it's usually tuning files. So a tuning file um, will contain the scale data or the tuning data. And you can generate these tuning files using um, software. There's various different software that can create these files. The main formats are SCL, that is a Scala scale file. And the other one is a, a TUN um, tune file. And various synthesizers can read these files. So if you're looking at your synth, then there'll be an option somewhere, load a tuning file. And you load it up, and then suddenly all of the, the notes that you play um, will come out in this new tuning. In terms of MIDI controllers, MIDI didn't know that anything changed then. Nothing had changed. I'm still pressing notes on my keyboard and MIDI data is still going in. It's just that what would have been a, a standard pitch is now going to be a slightly different pitch. So let's get a little bit more clarity about this. And then I'd also love to talk with you about what you see coming on the horizon. So mm. for example, if we're working in 22 EDO and you have a 12 EDO MIDI controller, your MIDI controller is set up for semitones or half steps, as, as we would say in the US. I think we also say semitones. Semitones is more correct for Europe. Anyway, um, the, whole, uh, the whole concept here is, are you now using from C up to the B flat as over the span of exactly. one, almost two octaves? You've got it. You've got it. And you can see from that, that's very odd that if you press a C and then the B flat that was like almost two octaves higher, that you would hear an octave. 
that's quite weird. Um, and this is one of the big difficulties with working with microtonal music is that MIDI controllers are often with a, a keyboard, like a, a piano interface. And a piano interface assumes that your scale is going to have 12 notes. If I have 22 notes, then as I go up by octaves, the, the fingering gets all weird because um, the fingering doesn't repeat in a, um, in a, what's the word? Like a standard, in a, the registers in a, in a linear don't way. repeat. The registers don't repeat in line yeah, with the keys. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that can be tricky. So for some people, that leads to them thinking, well, it's really important to me that um, whatever tuning I use makes sense on the piano interface, the keyboard interface. So some people limit themselves to 12 tone tunings, and other people just suck it up and think, okay, I'm just going to have to get my head around this, and I'll just have all of the keys linearly assigned to the you know successive uh, keys of my keyboard, and I'm just going to have to figure it out. I'm just going to have to memorize it. No. One one point of clarification, Sevish. If if we're doing twenty two EDO in our first our tonic, the our scale degree number one is going to be C. Wouldn't the next C be the B? So let's say we're starting on C four. The octave would actually be B five, not B flat five. Correct, because the twenty two notes gets you to B flat, and then the twenty third would be the octave at uh the b the b key correct um no that's not right because it's not 22 individual tones it's 22 intervals so essentially the first one doesn't count oh okay. it, so m plus it's one. from the yeah that kind of thing so for 22 edo uh yeah let's say you're starting on the c4 you would hear an octave up if you were to press the key b flat five gotcha flat five. yeah yeah, yeah. So we're thinking from from C to D, that's one. So it's not C's one, D's two. We're thinking of it right. the same way when we say whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. For remembering a major scale, we're starting one, we're going to two, and we're not measuring one, we're measuring the distance between mm -hmm. one and two. It's that kind of thing, yeah. Thank you for the clarification there, Savish. Can we talk a little bit about your hexagonal keyboard controller? Well, yeah, that's quite a good segue from talking about how standard MIDI controllers can be very tricky with this kind of thing because the, the layout is not designed for uh, tuning systems that have more or less than 12 tones. So again, I'm going to show this. Anyone watching on the video is going to be able to see this. Anyone else, I'm holding up a, a MIDI controller where it's a, a 2D layout. The, it's a, an array of hexagons. I'm sure there was some game show that I watched on TV as a kid that had this kind of layout where you well, had to, imagine a, imagine a honeycomb. It's like you're taking a slice right. of honeycomb and you've laid it out on your controller. Right. So the benefit of a interface like this is that fingering of different chords becomes the same in every single key. That applies to 12 equal as well as it applies to any other tuning system. Um, so let's assume I'm using 12 equal, the you know standard chromatic scale. If I were to go up the keys, like vertically, these are all perfect fifths. So I know that every time I go directly up, I'm always gonna hit the interval of a perfect fifth. So that's quite a handy thing to have. Um, if, I go, if I go diagonally in one direction, I'm always gonna get minor thirds. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't plugged this in um, so you're not going to hear anything. It's literally just a MIDI controller. It doesn't make any sound by itself. If I go diagonally the other way, that's always going to be major thirds. Huh. Um, so that's quite handy because I know that one certain shape, um, if if I learn the shape of a major triad, that it will be the same shape in every single key. And that wouldn't be the case um, on a standard piano because you have to learn um, for all the individual keys. And the same applies for scales. So if I learn the scale, um, like a major scale in C, I already know the major scale in F sharp. And for anyone who's audio right now, we're going to put a link in the show notes to Sevish's website where you can check out his setup and you can actually look at what we're talking about right now. Excellent. Sevish, those are all my immediate questions for you. Do you have anything you feel like we missed or you'd like to... Oh, we're going to talk about what's on... Uh, uh, on the horizons, the future. 
of microtonal oh, the tones. Oh, future, yes. Yeah. MIDI 2.0. And um, well, before that, MIDI polyphonic expression. Um, MIDI polyphonic expression comes from a need to kind of bring more expression into electronic instruments. One thing that this allows is a per note pitch bend. I remember when I was in high school and doing music lessons and we would mess around on the on the keyboards, we'd always me mess around with the pitch bend. And you, know, you can play a chord and if you move the pitch bend wheel up, it will go, the whole chord moves up and you move it down, the whole chord moves down. Okay, so we know that pitch bend already exists. So this is kind of a way to get those microtones if you want to do that. But it applies to every single note that you're playing. What if I wanted to have um, what if I wanted to play a chord where only one of those notes, the tuning changes? Well, I couldn't do that with a standard, with, with the old MIDI. With MIDI polyphonic expression, it's possible to do a pitch note, uh, sorry, a pitch bend for every single note. So um, that gives you quite a lot of options because you can take individual notes and, and tune them however you want. You know, in standard tuning, if you play um, if you play a major chord, for example, that um, that major third is actually a little bit sharp of what sounds what you would hear from uh, the harmonic series. So for it to be totally in tune, you might want to make that one note a little bit flat. Well, you could do that with MPE. Where is this going? Well, if you want to think not about individual tweaking of little individual notes, but you're thinking of whole new tonal systems microtonal scales, microtonal tunings, there's quite a lot of notes and there's quite a lot of data for someone to manually input that. But there are, and they're, they're coming out now this year, uh, new tools that, uh, new software tools that allow you to do this in a very systematic way, where for you as the musician, you would specify your tuning within this software and it would intercept the MIDI MIDI would go into it and it would do some funky MIDI polyphonic expression so that each note would automatically be tuned the way you want it to be. And that data gets sent to literally any synth that supports MPE. Any synth that supports it could then be microtuned. That's kind of where we're going. Some of the tools that I'm seeing that are being developed and that are being released recently, as recently as this week, and stuff, new stuff coming out in the next few months and a few months ago, it's happening right now. Where we're moving to is that um, you could potentially load your tuning up once and all of your synthesizers would all be in the correct tuning. And it's all because um, MPE, MIDI polyphonic expression, is becoming more widely supported. And because now that it's widely supported, people are building software tools that allow you to do this really systematic um, stuff. So that's exciting for me. And I recommend anyone who's on Twitter to follow Sevish on Twitter because you actually retweet this stuff and you talk about it and anytime there's a new sort of development, you actually tweet it out. And so it's you, you're almost like you could start a news organization like Microtonal News and like everything is just microtonal. Literally, the only thing I post about on Twitter is microtonal stuff. <laughs> so if you're only interested in that, you can always follow my Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and that's at Sevish, correct? Uh, it's at Sevish Music. At Sevish Music, folks. Go check it out. We'll put a link in the show notes as well. Excellent. So the implications here is that we can take standard MIDI controllers, we can take anything, um, and through some number crunching, uh, intermediate, intermediary step between uh, the MIDI and then the synth, we can then have a set tuning. And then on top of that, you can save a whole lot of time because instead of having to program every single synth, it's sort of like adjusting the key in a DAW where you just go up yeah. to the top, you select the key. And then if there's any uh, algorithms or any sort of machine learning software that's going to be based around that key, it's all going to groove with you. Right. Super fascinating. And Instruments that use not just the microtonal bending. I'm thinking of like the Roly keyboard. Have you ever tried playing with that? 
oh, I haven't. I'd love to, to try some of these things. Um, yeah, the, the Roly, there's um, quite a few. There's an instrument called the the Tonal Plexus, I believe, by HPI. That's the one that looks like um, a bunch of Legos. It looks like the little the little round tops of the Legos. Um, but I haven't tried any of these. Yeah, literally the only weird, in quote unquote, weird uh, controllers and instruments I've used are just the hexagonal keyboard controller that I showed you earlier. Oh, wow. Cool. Well, we'll have to uh, give a shout out to those companies and get them to send you send you over some products <laughs> so we can we can hear the beautiful result on your records. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes that enables you to stay creative, enables you to uh, output music at, I mean, a pretty decent clip. You're doing about an album right now uh, almost every year, every two years of complete sort of... Uh, soup to nuts uh you're doing everything um you are releasing them on a label though is that correct uh no i'm just releasing them independently at the moment for a while i did start my own uh net label as it were um where we were just putting up free downloads of um different microtonal music um but i've kind of that's dormant at the moment and i'm just literally just releasing independently so are you mixing and mastering your own stuff or are you are you outsourcing that no, I'm mixing and mastering my own stuff as well. I know, I know they say you're not supposed to mix and master your own stuff, but I've found that um, it sounds good enough to me. So no, no, it it sounds you're doing an amazing job. The reason why I I made that face was I was thinking about the amount of work because it's not like your music is like seven tracks in the truth. It's like it's fairly complex, and you have these meter changes and instrument changes, synth changes, and that all makes for a lot more work when it comes to balancing a mix. Yeah, it really does. Um, yeah, I've picked up a few tricks on over the years. Um, mastering itself, I don't find particularly challenging um, because I try and get those things right in the mix in the first place. And when I find issues during mastering, and you do, when you're mastering, you'd be like, okay, this needs a little bit of compression but the compressor's working in a way that I don't like. It's usually there is some, some element in the mix that either is too dynamic or tonally does not balance with the rest of the mix that triggers the compressor in a way that doesn't quite gel with, doesn't quite make things gel. So yeah, going back to the mix and getting things right in the mix, I think is the way to go. So talking about performance and create creativity questions, um, when it comes to lifestyle, how many hours of sleep do you like to get and how do you find sleep impacts your ability to be creative and perform musically? And when we say perform, I don't mean like go out and play a gig. I mean, just be able to do whatever it is you need to do that day. Yeah, I think sleep is really important. Um, I don't get exactly what I want. I would like to get about seven or eight hours. I, and I usually get about seven per night. Um, but on days where I don't have enough sleep, then you just don't quite feel with it. The other thing you need to under understand is I have a day job that's actually not music related. Um, so I, I have that to worry about. And it's, you know, it's quite a stressful job as well. And um, so music is a little hobby that happens on the side of that. It's something that I would do generally on the weekend if I have time for it, if I'm in the mood for it. And I'm more likely to be in the mood for it if I have good energy. So... Yeah, sleep's really important for that. We can totally edit this out, but do you mind telling me what your job is? Oh, I do, um, uh, let's say, kind of hosting, web hosting services for um, uh, a large corporate client. So IT stuff. IT stuff, <laughs> yeah. Super cool. Yeah, typical electronic musician does IT stuff, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're good with computers, you're good with computers, right? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm good with computers, but I like to make a couple of sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever used mindfulness or meditation to increase creativity or focus around music making? Um, no, at least not in a way that is at least not in a way that is me consciously doing it. 
but I believe that uh, making music is my meditation because, and this is all about flow, right? When I'm making music, I so easily slip into that kind of flow state and maintain that for long periods of time. And that's just, I just love that. I just feel really great when I'm doing that kind of stuff. And I think that having music as a hobby, the way I've had it for all of these years, you know, since I was a teenager has just been this kind of blessing in disguise because it it's almost been a kind of meditation um, to me. And times when I needed that quiet time, um, just make some tunes, just make some beats. And I, and I feel great afterwards. So you find that making music is sort of your way of dropping out of everything else that's going on and finding that really cool, like you mentioned, the flow and finding mm -hmm. that meditative state where it's just creation and then you're just moving and grooving and whatever happens, happens. And I think it's also very mm -hmm. interesting too that you don't have this state and this music tied directly to paying the rent. So you're able right. to sort of create a walled garden, a protected space around music where it stays this, uh, I hesitate to use the word sacred, but it, th this special this special moment for you where you're not obliged to make music for your living um, or you, you haven't chosen to make music for your living. You, you The bills are getting paid through something else and that when you're doing this, it's all about the creation and it's all about that state and the flow. Not to say it's not for someone who has to pay the bills with it, but there's certain psychological implications that come into play whenever your survival is tied up with an activity. Right, yeah, I, I think so. But I mean, I haven't had the experience of um, needing to do this music stuff in order to pay the bills. So um, because of that, I don't really know how I would react or how I would feel um, having to do that. Um, and uh, maybe one day I'll get to find out, I'm not sure, but um, it's quite interesting. Well, yeah, it's 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 my my little space. You know, I can have my own time and do and do that. It's a nice getaway from the everyday boring reality kind of stuff. So, how do people in your life support your ability to stay creative and make music? Yeah, you know, I live with my wife, and she perfectly understands when I want to make music. I just go and make music for a few hours, and 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 we. We hang out plenty aside from that. I think um, there's not really anything anybody needs to do because I'm fairly balanced with it. I'm not always obsessed about making music. There might be days where it's like, oh man, I've just come up with this new thing and I've got to see where it goes. And I'm working for like seven, or eight hours, like all day long. Uh, that doesn't happen that often. So there's not much that anybody needs to do to support me except just give me that little time every now and then. And yeah, it's working out. And with having that time every now and again, is that a conversation you needed to have or was that just part of the culture of how you were living? And so when your wife came into your life, she just sort of understood that that was the vibe. Yeah, it, yeah. it's never been a problem. It's just, we quickly fell into that. What are you doing? Oh, do you know what? I'm gonna make some music for a bit. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. That's fine. So yeah. I think you've actually already answered this next question with both your response and the sort of demonstrated culture of how you approach music, but do you define yourself as a musician, a human who makes and plays music or something else? I think the label musician is fine. I didn't see my, I didn't call myself a musician for a while because I thought that that there was maybe some qualification for that, but I don't think there is. You can even, I'm not going to say this is the context that I perceive, but you could even define music in such a way that everybody is a musician um, if you were inclined to do so. But yeah, I see myself as a musician, sure. But around this, I think, and maybe I need to work on this question workshop it a little bit, but I think of someone who defines himself as a musician, like that is their sole defining that's like their one word goal. Like I am a musician, like every waking moment, eating, sleeping, breathing, I am a musician. Versus when I think of a human who plays music, I think of someone who it sounds like you might be more in this boat where you have a really incredible balance 
between, and this is not to diminish anything you've accomplished or say, oh no, you are not a musician or impose some sort of qualification over it. It's just around the mindset, right? So it seems that you have this work-life balance where you're not living with a metronome on opening and closing cabinets and like cooking, you know, doing metronome games like cracking eggs on the third division of a triplet, you know, with a metronome clicking <laughs> once every four measures. Do you see where I'm going with this? Well, yeah, kind of, but um, I'm constantly thinking about music, you know. Ah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always, it's always on my mind. It's on my mind far more often than I'm actually able to do music. Huh. And um, I am, you know, if I'm in the kitchen, I am, you know, beatboxing, singing, doing whatever in there. Huh. Not that I would necessarily do that stuff on my own music, but yeah, certainly, especially with the beatboxing practicing those time signatures and weird grooves, just trying to nail certain grooves, certain polyrhythms and things. Uh, yeah, constantly doing that, humming along to the microwave. I think that's um, not too much of a unusual experience. <laughs> no, for it's not. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you find that having all this time to think about music, but then only really actually putting pen to paper, as it were, on the weekends helps you refine ideas or get you more clear in your head about certain goals around music? Yeah, I think so. Um, one thing I like to do is, um, one thing I like to do is when I'm working on some music, I will render a demo version and then when I'm not in the studio, you know, I might be taking a break. I might be walking the dog. I might listen to that. And just being away from the studio and having a different mindset, but then hearing the thing that you've been working on um, sometimes gives me ideas like, do you know what I feel in this section? It needs some melodic interest here. Um, or the, the kick drum is too DB, too loud is a specific one. And all, all of this kind of stuff. And very often I'll write that down. If, there's if, I, if my head is getting crowded out with too many of those thoughts, I just write them down so I can release that. And then when I, am, when I do have the time and the energy to work on music, I'll be like, oh yeah, I had all those ideas. And I look at my bullet points on my notes and I can go it. I'd load up my session and be like, right, the first thing, I usually pick the easiest thing to do. If it's, you know, that something needs to go up or down by a DB, that's the easiest thing to do. I usually get those, listen to it. Does it sound right? Yeah, cool. And then I try and move on to some of the more tricky ones. Oh, I need to write a new melody. That's when I need to like proper be um, in the zone to do that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that helps. And this goes back to, you alluded to your uh, iterative process that you're going back and iterating a whole lot on tracks mm. and I suppose taking this time during the week to listen, or even if it's on the weekend, let's, let's forget about days, going through this process that you just described of the story so far, what needs to change, making notes, changing, the story so far, what needs to change, making notes, changing. It's a very interesting yeah. way of working. Yeah, well, that's that's what comes naturally to me. And I... Um... If that sounds very interesting, I would like to know what other musicians are doing, to be honest, because I, 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 I didn't think that would be too unusual, the way I work. I don't know that it's unusual. I think, I think what renders it interesting for me is that it's happening during the week and you're having this mental, it's like this distillation that's happening where the thing's like percolating in your head and you're really walking through every facet of it mentally and then going and making the change. Whereas I think the tendency, especially within myself is like, if I, I don't have like a day job per se, I mean, I teach music and I'm writing books and all this sort of stuff. But like, if I get an idea for a mix and I have a minute, it's like, well, I'm on the computer, just fire up logic and I can make that change. But I'm not forced to go through the same period of, sort of abstinence from the computer that you are by virtue of the fact you're working a day job. And then the really interesting product of that is you get really clear about your ideas. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 
I, I do really feel like that time away allows an image to form in my mind and um, and allows me to make judgments in a slightly more objective way um, where I'm, I'm always coming at it fresh every time I fire up that song and listen to it on a different day. Um, I might get a different idea. And then sometimes when I do get back to the studio, I disregard what I what I thought previously. Sometimes I do take it in a different way. So I'm never always purposeful and you know with a with um with an objective in mind. Um, I do sometimes allow myself just the opportunity to mess around and figure things out as I go. But yeah, very often, and it's it tends to be towards that refining process in the track. I kind of feel like when I start a new track, it's about oh, I've got a kind of idea, and then things just naturally happen, and then suddenly I've got some really exciting music, or at least music that, that's exciting to me. And once there's a kind of song structure and things are getting nailed down, there then comes this process of refining. And it's during that refining phase that I'm more keeping notes and um, coming back to it on different days. And that's why some pieces of music just take me months to work on. And it's not necessarily that I'm spending many, many hours working on the music. It's just that I'll have several projects on the go and I, I just come back to them every now and then as my mood dictates. Uh, two questions as a follow-up to your answer. Number one, you said that you get an image forming in your mind. Are you talking about a literal image or are you talking about just the clarity around the direction of the song? Yeah, not a, li not a literal image, just um, the direction of the song. Yeah, a kind of a wholeness yeah. of what the song is. Or, um, a, yeah, like you said earlier on, like a distillation. Yeah. Uh, second second follow-up question on your answer. Um how many projects do you like to have going at the same time for your iterative process? Like, do you write the whole album and then you're iterating or is it sort of one song at a time it's coming in off the production line? Then it's never one song at a time. I do like to have more than a couple going at the same time. Um, sometimes I have too many projects going on at the same time and I feel that burden. Uh, with my most recent album, I... Um, I can't remember how many tracks are on it, maybe eight, seven, maybe seven or eight tracks. And there was a point at which all of those tracks had been started and good progress made on all of them, but none of them were finished. So there is actually a point where, and I, I don't normally do that. Usually I'll have a few finished and then I'm still working on five or six. And it's typical for me to have five or six, so many going at the same time. But with the most recent album, having kind of like the whole thing bubbling, at, kind of simmering at the same time, was on one hand stressful, but at the other time, I, I hope it kind of brought some cohesion as I'm in I'm maintaining this headspace while all of these different tracks are being worked on at the same time that kind of maybe brings them together. Or maybe not, I don't know. The, the new album is Bubble, uh, available anywhere you get your music. Um, question on that. Why did you, was there an intention to get to the place where you had eight tracks simmering or did it just sort of happen? Um, yeah, let's, let's start with that and then let's see if I have a follow up. Just, it just sort of happened. <laughs> just happened that way. And that's yeah. the first time it's happened like that before you've been a little bit more, I, I don't even know the word to use, methodical maybe? Well, it's, it's all the same thing really. Typically I would have a bunch of tracks on the go at the same time but I would reach a point with one or two of them where I actually finish those and then I'm still working on other tracks. Um, and you know, it's, it always feels like um, a lot of joy when I finish a track and I know that, okay, that's, that one's definitely going in the album and I'm still working on other stuff at the same time. So the one difference I'm seeing is on previous tracks, on previous albums, excuse me, you had more tracks. So was it because you had more tracks that you would then be finishing them while you still, still had other tracks open because you only did eight on this one? And again, only eight, I'm not making a judgment call as to more or less being good or bad, but it's fewer uh, than what you normally have on an uh, album up until now, let's say. Uh, was the fact that it was less songs the reason why maybe there was more open at the same time? Maybe. The other thing is a, f a few of these songs were quite long. So in terms of album length, it wasn't my shortest album. No, it wasn't. Um, yeah. 
yeah, it wasn't my shortest album, but um, I, I just don't know how it worked out that way. Hmm. There, at the same time as working on all of those album tracks, there were other tracks as well. I think there was more going on. So there could have been, you know, 12 different tracks that were going at the same time. And some of those I decided, you know what, they're not going to make it. Mm. Um, I don't feel inclined to finish all of them. Some of them are like, okay, it's a good idea, but it's not it's not the thing, you know, it's not the one. Mm. It doesn't have that stuff um, that makes it, that makes the cut. So, so talking about creativity, um, do you take any steps to stay or protect your creative space? No, I feel like it's kind of protected anyway. I have my music set up in the same place that I do my my day job because I work from home. So I kind of have this large desk that's just kind of got stuff set up. And I don't have as much room as I'd like, but um, it's pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be here whenever I uh, whenever I'm in the mood to work on music. When I talk about creative space, I also mean like headspace. So if you're having a day where, uh, let's say it's Saturday morning, you wake up, you've got a tune in your head, you want to go write it down. Um, are you going to take any steps to protect that creative headspace before you get into the studio? Or is it like you're just running for the room to get things down? Do you know what? I really don't know how to answer that. I don't think I have any specific... Pardon me. I don't think I have any specific thing that I do to maintain that headspace. Sometimes the ideas slip away before you get a chance to, to work on them. But, you know, that's always going to happen from time to time. The thing is, right, ideas, as much as they feel precious, they're not really that precious. Um, there's so many ideas. And if some of them slip by me, it's like, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> and um, actually, actually nailing it, actually achieving your vision it's a much more difficult thing to do, but that's the important thing to do. So I, I try not to fret about it too much. And sometimes things get away from me. So whatever. to be clear, what you're talking about is the amount of work it takes to get down an idea versus bring a song to distribution. To bring an idea or a song to distribution is a heck of a lot more work than just notating an idea down. Well, it's a heck of a lot of a lot more work than just having the idea in the first place. Ah, yes, indeed. Is what I mean. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> but what you're saying is also true. I would agree with that. Is there a time or a times of day where you feel more creative or you're more inclined to make music? Nighttime. Nighttime. It gets quiet. It gets quiet, and I get in the mood to do stuff like that. Have you ever experienced burnout from too much time spent specifically on music? Um, I think in a sense, yes. Um, yeah, there are times that I get, and particularly near the end of a creative cycle where I've got, I, I, I consider a creative cycle to be from the beginning of having an idea, I'm going to do an, another album, to actually finishing that. I call that my creative cycle. And they tend to last one to two years. But towards the end of that, when there's a lot of stuff that's already been nailed down and I've got a clear image of what it's turned out to be, which is almost always different from how I envis envisioned it in the beginning. Uh, but when I've got that clear idea, it's then all I see is the negatives. <laughs> I'm looking at I'm looking at the, what I've got so far and like, this needs to change, that sucks, this is too loud, this is too quiet. There's too much going on here. There's not enough going on there. And knowing all of this stuff is there, I feel this pressure to go and keep working at it and keep going at it um, because the end, the end goal is in sight. Like you can smell that finish. Like the day you release an album is so exciting because it's like, um, it's like you can finally let all that go, all of the agony of making music and all of the, the excitement you had. And then you pass that on to someone else and the audience listens to it. And then you're thinking about the next thing. Right. Um, so getting to that point is really exciting. But when you're working on it and you know there's a lot more you need to do to get it up to release standard, um, at least what I consider to be release standard for me, which is like not perfect, but good enough. Um, that is uh, that can make me feel um, a bit overwhelmed. And just naturally, I'll take a few a few weeks off. It, it happens. I don't have to think about it. I just stop feeling that drive at some point that I 
don't want to work on music. But you know what? It always comes back for me. Um, a few weeks later, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to listen to one of these tracks. Like I was saying earlier, I'll listen to a demo version and I'll be like, do you know what? I really want to try out this idea for this track. Having had that time to just get interested in something else, you know, um, coming back to music and then I, I'm right back in. I'm stuck in music again. So to be clear, this is like you've got what you feel initially are completed tracks that are ready to go. And then you take some time away and then you come back and listen. And now you're listening with the headspace of I'm going to play this for other people. I'm going to release this to the worldwide audience that I have. And this is going to be it. And then all of a sudden you have this list pop into your head of like, okay, that needs to change. That needs to change. I wish that was better. I wish that no, was better. No, no. No, okay. So no, no, I'm it's not. Like, I, I don't. I don't. Well, you're almost there. I don't consider them to be completed tracks at that point. I consider them to be tracks that need to go through that refinement stage. I see. Okay, now this refinement stage. This is the refinement stage we were talking about earlier. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, got it. And so after a track has gone through that refinement distillation space however long that takes however many weeks it takes however many iterations it takes then it's done then it's released ready yeah pretty much um i mean i'd never feel like any work is really done there's always stuff that i want to change i th I, I think this is a pretty universal sentiment amongst <laughs> all artists visual musical anything is that um you never were able to achieve that perfect thing but at some point i make the judgment of do you know what that's good enough and then I give it my rubber stamp. Yep, that one's done. And I start uh, looking at the next. And we can do these next ones rapid fire because we're, we're almost out of time uh, for the time I asked you to spend here today. Um, what's the maximum length of time for an effective uh, working session for music for you? Maximum length of time in a single session? Yes. Um, Okay, depends on the focus of the session. It could be four or five hours. If I'm in the early stages, it's very creative. I'm trying to get down as many ideas as possible. And while the, you know, while the tap is open and it's all flowing through, just keep it flowing. Um, if I were mixing or mastering, it would be a totally different issue. I wouldn't be spending five hours doing it, especially mastering. I would spend maximum of 45 minutes before I went and did something else. Yeah. Uh, when you had the um, longest duration of time that you spent on a session, do you have an approximation of what that would be like? Have you ever spent like 10 hours just working, 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 working? I've got no idea. I might have done. It wouldn't surprise me if that's happened before, um, but I can't quite remember. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a testament to your state of flow at the time. Uh, Maybe so. When When you're in composition mode, uh, or even just generally working, is there a way that you like to segment or divide your time? Like if you have multiple tracks open, are you going to get the creative stuff done first and then do a little mixing, a little mastering, call it a day? Are you just going to do creative stuff on a day, just do mixing stuff on a day? How do you segment that? Uh, no, I don't structure it. Whatever idea I get, I chase the next thing that, that pops into my head. That includes mixing. I think that mixing especially for electronic music, should happen during the, the creative process. In fact, mixing needs to happen throughout because getting that mix right is um, part of the genre. It's just kind of the standard for the genre. Um, I think some people get an idea in their head that they have to compose everything and produce everything before they go into mixing. I suspect this, this view comes from maybe the old days where you and your band would rehearse. You would go into the studio for recording day and you would track the song you'd record the song and that all that was that kind of the production as it were and then it goes on to mixing um it doesn't make doesn't make sense with electronic music where everything's totally editable i can decide very late on in the process to change instrument to change a tuning system um that's happened before uh, various things so mixing can happen at any point and i don't structure my time i just if i get an idea that this needs to change I make that change and then I move on to the, the next idea. How do you experience ideas? Do you experience them as a download, as an upwelling of creativity? What is your experience when you have a new idea? Um, I kind of hear it in my mind's ear. So, audiating. Talk about, 
Yeah, kind of. Um, and it's not always very clear. But um, yeah, I usually have that kind of idea. It's um, it's something I experience. It doesn't really come from a technical or theoretical level, but more of um, actually hearing something. And do you ever hear music in your sleep or in your dreams? And then are you able to retain it when you wake up? Yeah, I've heard music in my dreams. And sometimes I've had dreams where I feel like the musical idea is very good. I've never been able to get any of these ideas down. Uh, most of the time I it's inconvenient or I can't be bothered to try. But I do suspect it's probably just some melody for, from some pop song that I've been playing or something like that. And the... Um, I could I, I could afford to let that one slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, Sevish's new album Bubble is available at sevish.bandcamp.com forward slash album forward slash bubble and everywhere you get your music, you can find Sevish at sevish.com. Again, everyone go check it out. It's an incredible website with so much information. It's so cool. You can also check him out at youtube.com forward slash Sevish, Sevish, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been great. It's been fun.